Hey guys, my name is Jessie Mew, and welcome back to Adam's Quest. In the last episode, we began carving out a very unique path for our new family, the Oracles. We placed some genes in their mutation menu that we haven't seen in such a long time, especially those bare unit ears. They are so, so cute. Honestly, I think these two babies might be some of my favorite creatures in the entire tribe just because of those bare unit ears alone. And of course, Daylight over here has the antennas too, so that means she's going to be able to take on her mother's role when she eventually passes. Malassi is getting quite close to the end of her lifespan, so she doesn't have much longer to have any more babies. I'm not sure if she would want to just teach the two that she has right now, teach them to be strong members of the Oracle family. Daybreak, after all, he's the one who has the might of the sun, just like his father, Sunslash. They both have those big bodies, which will be very important in the mountains. His sister is one of the very few females on the island, too. Like, we are getting dangerously low on females, I've noticed. So maybe we do want them to have a few more babies? I don't know, might be a good idea. That way, Daylight wouldn't be alone if she does have a sibling with the antennas too. Actually, let's check out what their prediction says today. In two days, the weather will be sunny. Okay. Maybe we could take that as in two days. That's when she's going to have her next child. Maybe the might of the sun will give their baby good luck. If it's going to be nice and sunny and warm, then I can't imagine a better time. Then meanwhile, we have the royal nests over here, which have literally been covered in shadows. I have never seen a mask take over a baby like this. It's very, very confusing. I'm sure it would be a little bit worrying to somebody like Malasi. It's almost as if her sunny children have cast a shadow directly over the royal nest. Sairi must be over the moon, though. As one of the bandits, this must be a good sign to her. Maybe that's even why she named her child so close to her first son, Tavan Ku and Tavan. Maybe she's hoping that they'll take up the roles of the bandit brothers of old. But I can't really see Tavan Ku being interested in that sort of mischief. To be honest, I can see him finding his little brother to be more of a nuisance. He almost reminds me of the Cheshire Cat in a way. I could definitely see him kind of slinking through the shadows of the swamp. A big, toothy smile, the only thing you can see. I mean, you can't even see his eyes. It's only his mouth, a little portion around his muzzle that you can see clearly through that mask. Unfortunately for Tavanku, I don't think he's going to have much of a say in the matter. He's going to have to come over here to protect his little brother, because I think Sairi is going to start seeking out the oracles next. She's a little bit worried because her voyage wasn't very successful, at least not in her eyes. She wanted to come out here to gather up some food for her babies, but I think all she actually brought back was one measly coconut. So she's hoping that Malassi can shine a little bit more light on the situation. So as Meadowhawk goes ahead and gathers up the last of those poison berries, let's have him switch places with Tavanku. Thankfully, the bluebirds are no longer in our skies, so we shouldn't have to worry about them getting swept away. But all the same, Sairi is not taking any chances. She won't risk anything being stolen from her. She is a very selfish creature, and I feel like that's kind of shined through time and time again. Not only with the poison berries, not only with the coconuts, all these voyages to find food that isn't even hers, but also with the bluebird feathers themselves. I feel like that's probably still a bit of a sore topic between her and her brother. So I wonder if those two are going to cross paths again. They are going to be quite close to each other, so I wouldn't be surprised. Let's have Sairi scoot up here. That way she should be able to see the brand new Oracle family. And it looks like we have some leeches lurking too. If we could have Sand Dragon maybe jump in here to knock down some more coconuts. There we go, the leech moved. That means you should be able to come over here. Oh, the leech is frightened of you, Sunslash. That's actually kind of surprising. I guess it can feel that heat radiating off of your body. That sunny fur is definitely intimidating it. We'll knock down some more coconuts for us. Still no leech. Then you can jump back here to collect all of those on the next turn. Huh. I guess it skittered off. I wonder if it's looking for you instead, Kurovan. It is possible, so we're going to have to keep an eye out for that too. Unfortunately, our creatures can't sense the leeches when they're in the water. 
There's no here in a slippery little leech as it swims around in the ocean. Well, Meadowhawk, I think Sairi would probably direct you toward the poison berries. Like, I'm sure that Malassi would let her know there's plenty of food over here for them to eat, so Meadowhawk is going to be the one to gather them up. That's probably pretty good for Kurovan, too. I mean, if he saw his sister's family coming up on the horizon, he would probably want to hightail it out of here. But aside from that, he has some different matters to attend to. He needs to find one more route. Just one more route to set the remains of Beowulf's family to rest. He's already set Beowulf's mother to rest, I guess, but he still needs to find one more for his father. Now, I wonder if Petaltail would want to help him out too? I mean, he is really not interested in just sitting around here gathering berries all day. He wants to have an adventure as well, but his brother is pretty hard on him. Sandraken thinks it should be their job to keep everybody in the tribe fed. Ah, there's that little leech. I knew you would be back, little Kai. I wonder if you thought that Meadowhawk looked a little bit more appetizing. Well, you're going to have to be careful then. I guess Sunslash will keep a close eye on you until you have a little bit more energy. Then you can settle down between these two berry bushes, and you shouldn't have to worry about them finding you again. It's nice to see that there's another permanent nest out here too. So I suppose Sairi could even settle down here and potentially have another baby. For now, let's bring her back here. I guess she could help by clearing out some of the area around this nursery. Though to be honest, it seems like Malassi is probably going to be doing most of the work. Let's bring Sunslash back here for now. That way you can keep an eye on both of their little babies. And we'll scoot Malassi back here to have a nice quick chat with her leader. They can talk a little bit more about this supposed prophecy of hers. Now, the only thing that has me concerned about Kurovan is his poison fangs. The poison fangs means that he won't have a very high sense of smell, so it's going to be very tricky for him to find those roots. In fact, if he's not already sitting right next to one, he's not going to be able to sense it at all. It would be much better for them if they could find another creature with the big nose, perhaps, to bring with them, but until those babies grow up, it's not very likely. So, Petal Tail for now? I guess you're going to be carving the pathway for us? Let's have him use his big bear Yina claws to claw down some of that grass. That way they won't get lost. Beowulf, on the other hand, he's still out here trying to train little Nuvon. I wish we had a Dodomingo around here. To be honest, attacking the Dodomingos seems to be the best way to bring out the bear Yinas. And that's all these two are lacking for their story. Nuvon is still trying desperately to prove himself. So I guess for now we'll just bring him back to the tide pools. Oh, and you found a nest out here? Oh, I wonder if somebody is living out here too. Oh, and they even found a root. Wait a second, Beowulf. Come on over here and pick up this grass. Oh, there's two nests. Berry bushes aplenty. This looks like a very suspicious base, doesn't it? Well, I guess, Nuvon, you could go ahead and pick a couple of those berries while we're waiting. There's no fish out here for you guys to gather up anyways. But I really do wonder if somebody has been living here all along. It's pretty secluded. Our tribe has never been out this far before. So if somebody was living on this island without us knowing, that would be a pretty good place. Now aside from Tavon Coombe, who could at least try to pick up some of these coconuts, we just have treasure and damselfly in the ocean. So, I'm starting to think that Treasure may have found his calling. And to be honest, it was all thanks to Damselfly. She was the one who leapt into the ocean after coupling up one of those water-breathing plants, and she led him in this direction, where he can see that there are plenty of treasures to discover down here. So I wonder if he would take this as a good way to honor his father's memory? Perhaps, since Spook was such an adventurous soul, they could even carve out a little path of water breathers to take to all of these new islands. They can claim the treasures of the sea for themselves. I feel like that would be a pretty good way to honor Spook's memory, and I'm sure that Damselfly would agree. She's just happy to see Treasure happy too. So perhaps, if they are thinking about starting a family, it would be a good idea for them to collect some of this algae. They could definitely use this for some nest building purposes, especially if they want to impress Splash. I think we'll bring Damselfly up here. 
I don't think she would want to have her nest in the water. Not only could that be trouble for her if she ends up running out of her water breathing skill, but her babies aren't guaranteed to have it either. So instead, I suppose she could go back to the tide pools where she was born. She could even give her brother a little bit of company. Poor sand dragon. He's trying his best to keep everybody fed, but I feel like he's probably a little bit lonely. He doesn't really have many friends to talk to after all. So as Daybreak takes his very first steps out of the nest, settling down right beside his father, eager as ever to learn a little bit more about his heritage, I think it should be time for us to skip the day. So let's go back here just to make sure that nothing is going to come out at our brave explorers. Just to make sure that nobody is lurking around here at this base. It is very, very curious. I suppose that could even be where our oracle set up camp first. We did figure that Malasi probably came from this direction. She probably followed the routes all the way to our tribe. Maybe this is where we're going to find more of those oracles that we need so much. Well, it's something for us to keep our eyes on. We'll keep sniffing around as we go deeper. But for now, let's bring treasure all the way to the surface. Oh my goodness. Damselfly, thankfully, still has enough of the water-breathing skill, but Treasure, with his tail fin, he is so quick. I can see him actually dragging Damselfly to the surface. He's probably a little bit concerned that she's getting in too deep, and I'm sure he's very excited to build this nest for their too. His very first algae-covered nest. Hopefully Splash is going to take notice. So because we're going to a mountain next, I know that it's going to be hard on these water-breathing creatures. Honestly, I kind of just want to see if it's possible to make a line of water breathers that would be able to survive on these different islands. I feel like there must be a way, but in order to do so, I wonder if maybe we want to swap around our water body for the gills. If we give them the gills instead, then we could try to weasel the big body under their babies. Once we have that unlocked in our mutation menu at least, or maybe if we even breed one of their future children with the big-bodied oracles. So what we'll do for them is we'll place the gills into their first slot, and then for the second one, should we go with a normal body? The medium body, perhaps? Just to give them a little bit of cold resistance? It's the best thing that we have to work with right now, so I guess that's what we're going to choose. We'll give Damselfly the gills, too. And then as far as her tail goes, I wonder if we should try to keep the mermaid tail on them, that giant tail fin. That seems like a good idea. It is a very distinct feature of our pirates after all. That's one thing that I don't want them to lose. So go ahead and breed with Damselfly. Oh no, it's going to take some extra turns. Oh, their fertility must be a little bit low. Oh, it's not that low, Treasure. Well, maybe she's hoping to build her nest over here a bit more. This was about where she was born, and I guess it would give her babies more shelter from the potential dangers of the ocean, especially if they're not ready to get their feet wet just yet. Now it looks like our shadow might be ready to make his first steps out of the nest too. Let's have him tumble out of the nest. Of course, looking for his mother, probably. But Devanku is going to have to hold him back. Ooh, actually... I wonder if our mischievous little bandit may have been tampering with the nest a little bit. Maybe he saw all of that algae too and he just couldn't resist playing with it. Since he is quite the troublemaker, I can definitely see that happening. So that's why Damselfly has to wait that one extra day to have her baby. Tafanku is probably just so fed up already. He just wants to be out on the field helping his patients, not babysitting for his pesky little brother. We've had a lot of rifts between our siblings lately. And I feel like that's all being modeled after Sairi and her own brother, too. Interesting how our leader has a problem with her brother, and now everybody else seems to be following suit. Maybe this would be a good time for Kurovan to offer his advice to Peneltail then. He knows he doesn't have a very good relationship with his sister either, but he really wishes that he did. He knows that Adam's family was always so close, so he's not really sure why she hates him so. She won't let him near any of her precious bluebird feathers, as if he would really try to steal them. And then for that matter, his own mother, Silas' spirit, she just never seems interested in visiting. I wonder if she's afraid that he's going to send her off, that'll send her soul far away from the island now that he knows how. So that's left our little gravedigger all alone, 
separated from his family, and he doesn't wish that on any other creature. So I think he would try to convince Petaltail that he really needs to fix things up with his brother. But thank goodness, Kurovan, you can jump all the way down here, and you can dig up that final root for us. And I'm sure that Beowulf is very, very thankful that you're around. So Petaltail, you might as well just grab up those berries, Maybe since he is thinking about patching things up with his brother, he'll grab those berries so he has something to offer. And then as for you two? I don't know, I'm still curious if maybe we can find anybody out here. So let's have you two start making your way deeper into the grasses. Should we have them follow the tide pools? Just in case there's more fish? I guess there's no guarantee that there will be any food out here for them to eat. But at the same time, at least we have some poison berries for Nuvan. Something is better than nothing. Maybe we should have Beowulf just destroy the berry bushes too. I suppose that that could always be a good plan. I don't think too many creatures are going to be picking them way out here, especially since we really want to get them back to the ports. And we still have one more day to go before Malassi has her next child. I believe it's just one more day for that sunny weather. So let's have her come on down here to breed with the sun slash again. And then I guess she might as well settle down on the nest. Another one of her prophecies coming true. So that'll give sun slash some time to guide Meadowhawk over to the poison berry bushes. He might as well take daybreak too. I feel like this would be a good learning opportunity for him. It's quite likely that he's going to have to guide his fair share of creatures to warmer places in the mountains. It looks like you two even have some fish that you can scoop up too. Well, let's bring Daybreak around this way. That way they can light up a little bit more of the pathway to those poison berries. We'll have them try their best to distract all of the leeches, I suppose. Just in case they get a little bit too eager. And that leaves Malassi to train her daughter. Who I feel like must be getting a little bit nervous with that big shadow looming right behind her nest. Sairi's family was always known as the Shadows in Malasi's prophecy anyways. The Shadows were too weak to go to the mountains alone, and that's why they needed the might of the sun. So maybe Daylight can even sense the biggest shadow of all, looming in those royal nests. She does have those powers too. I wonder if that would bring that all to light in Malasi's eyes. Maybe she would realize that she hadn't finished guiding Sairi at all. Those shadows are still far, far too hasty for their own good, and they need something to balance themselves out. Maybe this would even be a good way for them to tie Beowulf back to the migration too. They could have them go out in search of Beowulf himself, because he's also quite the interesting little shadow, and he has much, much better strength than anybody else in Sairi's family. I believe Malasi even met Beowulf, so maybe her next prophecy, or at least the next chapter, would guide Sairi to go find the other half of Anamim's champions. Balance is the one thing that Sairi has lacked all her life, so this is going to be Malassi's one last chance to rectify that. Now for what might be their very last child, let's go ahead and skip the day, and we'll see if maybe Daylight is going to have another Oracle sibling? An Oracle sibling with the platypus beak? Oh my goodness! Oh, the platypus beak came from Malasi. I almost forgot that that was in her traits. And of course, because Sunslash has the Baryena snout. Oh, it's just a little bit more dominant, I guess. And he has the big ears too, which is kind of unfortunate. It's not as though that's going to help him once we do go to the mountains. Oh, but at the same time, I mean... This is what our grave diggers have been lacking too. He might not have the digging paw to truly mark him as one of the family, but with that platypus beak, he should be able to dig up the worms in the sea floor. And I guess he would probably be guided in that direction by his antennas anyway. So that's very interesting. I guess our ancestors do want us to put the remains of Silas' soul to rest after all. Maybe once we take care of that, the path to the next island will be clear. Well, I think we'll name this little baby Sol, if just to simply represent the sun. And then we'd best start sending Sari off on our mission, especially if her own mother is about to depart from this island soon. As soon as Sol can get his little platypus beak and all those worms in the sea floor. Actually, let's bring her over here so she can breed again with Meadowhawk before she goes. She might as well take a very quick pit stop at the nest. Was that one of you? 
A little daybreak, of course. It seems like the leeches just aren't interested in Sunslash, but I guess your son doesn't share the same good luck. Maybe now would be a good time to lead you guys out of the water then? We'll bring Sunslash up here, that way he can guide Cyrus straight over to the nest. Though with Malasi just about to pass away, I wonder if Daybreak would sense that more. He might not have the antennas in full, but he still does have quite the connection to his Oracle family. So we'll have them part ways for just a moment, that way he can settle down next to them. And I suppose he could even dig out one of those roots for her too. He does have the digging paw. Oh, and there's a root right back here as well. Well, at least we know we have a place that we can bring her when the time comes. And she knows that her time has unfortunately come. But she wouldn't want any of her babies to be sad, of course. She just wants them to all stick together. Now, can we please build our little water baby's nest in peace to fun? Maybe we'll have them scoot their way down the shore. If we bring Damselfly over here, hopefully we'll be able to breed them now. Actually, I think this is like the very same place that she was born, so this must be very nostalgic to her. Oh, and we have a root over here too. You know, that one might actually be a little bit more fitting for them to use once they do put Molossi's remains to rest, since that was about where she had dug up the roots for Kurovan's teachings. So I think Treasure should probably stick around here for his baby. We'll bring him up here to line up a little bit more of the grasses. That way we'll know that nothing nefarious is lurking in those depths. And to Vaughn, that means all of your fun has unfortunately come to an end. So let's have him dash across the tide pools. He's probably a little bit more curious about the creatures by the ports. They look so different, of course, with their bright sunny fur, those big glowing antennas. If he's anything like his mother, he is going to be very curious to get to know them. Oh, and Tavanku, you better go after your brother then. There's no telling what sort of troubles they'll get into. We might as well put him up here so he'll be right on top of the hill. That way he can gaze down and make sure that his little brother isn't getting into too much trouble. So I think all we have left is Beowulf and the grasses. Anybody out here for us to invite? Nope, all still seems quiet, unfortunately. All is quiet in the swamps. And I think everything is pretty much blocked off by those thorns too, so I'm not sure if you're going to find what you're looking for out here. I think it might kind of be a lost cause. In fact, let's have Beowulf come down here so we can start swiping down some of these berry bushes. We'll go ahead and destroy this one first. I think that would allow our creatures to move a bit more freely between them. Oh, and Petal Tail. Oh, I wonder if he would take that as a good teaching. He does want to bring back tons of food to his brother, so maybe he figures that this is the best way to go about it. It is going to destroy that food source entirely, but Sand Dragon doesn't need to know that far. He'll just think that you've been doing some incredible work out here, finally putting all of his advice to good use. Now Kurovan, it seems, is going to stumble directly into his sister next. And all for good reason, too, because he could guide her toward Beowulf. I think even she would remember Beowulf a little bit, from her childhood at least. That grand creature who took down a bear Yina all by himself in the camp, and then turned off to the wilderness to fight for the goddess of war. But I guess the true question is, would he lead her in the right direction? Or would he take this as his one and only chance to perhaps extract a little bit of revenge? Make her feel like the way she's made him feel ever since they were very, very young. To be honest, I'm not sure if he would have the heart once he sees another little baby in the nest. And look at this guy. He almost looks like one of our mushrooms of old. Day 400 in Adam's Quest has brought us the rebirth of the mushrooms in Duke Ronu. He is super cute. And he can pick up plenty of those poison berries too with his father. So I guess he's found another little buddy for that. Thanks to his poison fangs, he's a little bit more... Oh my goodness. A little bit more apt for the role than Devanku. But I think our hopes of a guild baby have come true. The gills look massive on the little babies. Hopefully he doesn't have the water body. Excellent. It looks like all of our plans have worked out for the better. And she is super cute too. She looks like a little leopard almost. Or maybe like a cheetah? With that sleek head of hers, I can see her being very, very quick in the water too. Perhaps not as fast as her father because she doesn't have the tail fin, 
but the stinky tail is still a pretty good thing for us to keep around. I guess it's even more fitting since her father was quite susceptible to Mulberry's misfortune, so she's going to be able to make sure that nothing like that ever gets to him again. So as the first guild creature to join our tribe, I think the name Trinket might be a cute one to use. She'll be able to go diving into the ocean in no time, searching for shells with her nimble fingers, fish with her claw. She is going to be a pretty excellent little food collector too. So I guess this was a pretty lucky place for you to set up your nest, and it was a very, very lucky in terms of Splash. Splash has his eyes on your family, so let's hope that means plenty of fish in the mountains to come. So in the next episode, with all of this new information is circling around in Sairi's mind, hopefully she'll be able to find Beowulf somewhere off in the swamps. We really need to bring this little guy back. I hope we'll be able to find him a mate too. Unfortunately, quite a few of our creatures have this D and H immunity, so we're kind of getting low on compatible partners. But it would be great if, just like his half-brother Sunslash, if he was able to send a little group of shadows off to the mountains as well. That way they could balance each other out, just like Molossi said. In Daybreak, it's going to be your job to find that route in the next episode as well. I wonder if perhaps Daylight is going to be the one to guide Soul to the water? Since they share those antennas, I can definitely see her understanding what he needs. Maybe he'll even be like our oracles of old. Maybe he is a bit more silent than his siblings. Maybe he doesn't talk at all, and he only communicates through the twitches of his antennas. Something that Daylight could definitely communicate to the other members of her tribe. Oh, and of course, then there's Tavan, who's lurking mysteriously behind those thorns. Oh, I bet they see that big, toothy grin right now, peering from the darkness. How do you guys think these two families would clash? I feel like there's a lot of storytelling potential in Tavon, but I'm curious what you guys think he would get up to. What kind of mischievous little pranks would he pull on the rest of his tribe? For now, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you all next time. Bye, guys!